Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Steinberg, who is uh, going to talk to us about Cartan pairs of algebras. Uh, take it away, Ben. Okay, so like to first of all thank the organizers for giving me this chance to come to Prague again. It's great to be back in Prague <laughs> and the beaches of Prague, as you can see behind me. <laughs> well, hopefully one day I can come again in person. I think the last time I went to Prague was like in 2007 or something like that. So it has been a long, long time. Um, and Czech Republic is always a fun place. So uh, this, this work is with a bunch of authors, as you can see from the list, so I won't try to go through them all, but um, it originally started essentially as two papers. And then when we realized we were working on the same stuff, we decided to join forces rather than try to, you know, have two competing papers. Usually it's better to join forces. And so I think the final result is better than either of the two original things. Um, so here's my outline. So, um, so I should apologize that these slides were originally designed for when I was talking in Colorado, where I thought the audience would be mostly algebraists. And then I was invited here. So I thought I'd reuse the slides. So I apologize that the analytic part is not gonna be up to speed for this audience. And I particularly apologize because I actually don't know any analysis. So <laughs> I, anything that's wrong is all my fault and not my poor co-authors. Um, so in the 60s, as most people here probably know, Feldman and Moore began to study Cartan pairs of von Neumann algebras in this famous Feldman Moore papers. I actually first learned about these papers in my second life as a group theorist, because this is the paper where certain kinds of Borel equivalence relations with countable classes are shown to come from group actions and people in group theory like that. And I didn't know it had anything to do with von Neumann algebras until I got into this business. But roughly speaking, a Cartan pair consists of a von Neumann algebra A and a maximal abelian subalgebra or massa B where B sits nicely inside of A. And all you guys know better than I what this means. Um, if you gave me a, a multiple choice test on the Feldman and Moore pa uh, paper, I might get a 70 if I'm lucky. But if you gave me a written exam, I definitely would fail it. So uh, there's no, I'm not capable of actually telling you the real details about this. But roughly speaking, what they proved is that all the Carton pairs come from a special sort of twisted groupoid algebra. In fact, their groupoids are equivalence relations, so they're the nicest ones in a sense possible, and it's in the measured theoretic setting. And then the commutative subalgebra are the functions on the unit space. Okay, and I'm not gonna get into the details of how you define this or anything, but basically the groupoid or the equivalence relation and the twist are uniquely determined by the Carton pair, you know, up to cohomology. And then afterwards, Kumjian and Renault, not in joint work, but in a series of works where each one kind of improved on the previous guy's work, they construct, they created a C-star algebra version of the theory of Carton pairs. So Renault originally had a theory using co-cycles, then Kumjian realized that you can't get away with just co-cycles. And then, but he worked with very restricted kind of notion of diagonal subalgebra. And then Renault looked at something more analogous to maximal commutative subalgebras. So that's kind of the rough idea. And basically the C-star Carton pairs come from twisted groupoid algebras, especially tau groupoids. Now Hui pointed out at the last seminar I gave on this, um, which I didn't include in here, that there's also kind of a non-commutative Carton pair theory that he started where you use kind of fell bundles and stuff like that. And I think that Tristan has done just on the archive yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, you know, some sort of kind of non-commutative Cartan theory from uh, kind of as well. Um, in fact, more general than a Cartan theory, um, but I haven't had time to really read through it. So I apologize, Tristan. I did flip through some pages though. No in any event, in the Renault and Kumjian theory, the group weight and the twist are unique. Again, and I think, so I'm not a C-star algebraist. So I think for people doing C-star algebras, this Cartan pair theory is quite interesting in its own right. But for people who are doing things like symbolic dynamics, it's also quite interesting because of work that started with Matui and Matsumoto. There's been further work, work I saw Toka Carlson here and others who have kind of expanded this further and went beyond the analytic context. But basically I think Matui and Matsumoto started this business of observing that basically you get Cartan pairs from shifts of finite types. 
So a shift of finite type, this audience knows what that is. It's a dynamical system you get from a finite graph. You just look finite directed graph. You look at all the infinite paths on the graph. And you have the shift map, which deletes the first letter or the first edge of the path. And it's long been known that there are connections between the shift of finite type, the graph C-star algebra that you associate to E, and the Levitt path algebra, which is kind of the discrete analog of the C-star algebra. And um, these connections are, are, are quite classical at this point. Perhaps the most famous example of a connection is that the bowen franks group which, of, a symbol, of a shift of finite type, which was introduced by Bowen and Franks, is the K0 group of both the graph C-star algebra and the Levitt path algebra. And in some sense, it was the, the observation by Kuntz and Krieger that this bowen frank group is K0 that kind of led to the idea that you maybe can use you know, Kuntz Krieger algebra is to understand shifts and classify them. And in some sense, I think this is important, though I'm not an expert on this to this whole classification theory's history. I mean, I think really Kuntz Krieger algebras were the first kind of interesting C star out simple C star algebras classified by K theory, as far as I know. But again, I'm not an analyst. I don't even play one on TV. Now, under something called condition L, which people definitely knew in Colorado, but it may be here, I'm not sure everybody knows what it is, but um, I think for figure algebras, this was called like type two or something like condition two or something like that. It was one of their three conditions with, with, with bold, with uppercase Roman numerals. And anyway, in any case, it's a certain condition on the graph or, or, or on the C star algebra. And if you have the under condition L, the graph C star algebra and the continuous functions on the path space form a Carton pair. If your graph strongly connected and like not a cycle, then you'll get condition L. So that might be familiar from Kuntz Krieger algebras. And Matsuya Matsumoto, also known as M&M, &M, characterized continu continuous orbit equivalence of shifts of finite type by the isomorphism class of the Carton pair, or equivalently by the groupoid. So you can read this continuous orbit equivalence from the groupoid. And I guess it was observed, I'm not sure if it was just Matsuya Matsumoto, also the people following him, that you can deal with flow equivalence by basically blowing up the graph to an infinite graph so that you can deal with tensoring with the compact operators. So, and this has certainly been exploited by, by Carlson and others in their work. And again, I'm not an expert. So the question that occurred at the beginning of this stuff that I think is very natural is can the same be done for Levitt path algebras, LPAs? So basically what's a Levitt path algebra? If you don't know, you take a graph C star algebra as given by generators and relations. And you say, instead of viewing those generators and relations as defining a C star algebra, let's say they define a, a, a complex algebra or a real algebra or an algebra over the two element field. Nothing wrong with the two element field, right? <laughs> Analysis over the two element field is very easy. Even I can do it. So uh, the LPAs are what are called by some people Steinberg algebras of ample groupoids. Um, I thank all the people in New Zealand, Australia, and what like for, for, for naming these after me. I'm not sure it's actually appropriate, but so in any event, it seems like the name has stuck. I, I think Zorn didn't really like the Zorn's Lemma or Zorn's Lemma. I'm not complaining, but it was nicer than necessary. Um, so a series of work by people basically showed that, yes, all this carton pair st stuff worked for Levitt path algebras. There's a paper by Brown, Clark, and Anif, where they were basically showed that if you have star isomorphisms of Levitt path algebras, which preserve diagonal pairs and the group boys are preserved, then Ara, Boza, Hasvat, and Sims, they got rid of the star stuff and they were working more generally than Levitt stuff. Then there was a much stronger result by Carson and Rout, which in particular let you work over more general rings. And then I had the most general result along these lines. Uh, these, I think maybe there's something more recent by Tristan and Lisa, but um, Roughly speaking, that also further generalized the rings and group points to which the stuff applies. And basically, what, you, what it shows is you can always recover the group, the path groupoid of a graph from the Levitt path algebra and its diagonal subalgebra, its commutative subalgebra, which is just the locally constant maps on the path space. So you just look at all the maps from the path space to your field which are locally constant. So this, in the complex case, this would be dense in the C star algebra because it's totally disconnected. Um, and, and when you complete the Levitt path algebra with the appropriate norm, you do get the graph C star algebra. But notice what I, the extra thing here is all cases. For graphs in the, in the C star world, you seem to need condition L. 
without conditional, it's not quite a classical Cartan pair, it's what we call a quasi Cartan pair. But you, in the algebraic world, you can go farther than you can do in the analytic world. So that's kind of a weird thing. And you can prove analogs of Matsu, Matui and Matsumoto's work for LPAs and Carlson, Raut, Sims, and other people who were involved in this gave applications. I also want to mention there's a beautiful paper by Toke where he shows that if you have a star isomorphism of Levitt path algebras over the integers, it automatically preserves the diagonal subalgebra, the commuted subalgebra. And so star isomorphism already determines the group void over Z. So that's kind of a sign that working over coefficients which are not fields might be a good idea. Of course, when you work over rings which are not fields, then you have to throw in the whole ideal structure of that ring, right? So that you, ha you have to you know, pay a price. But one thing that was missing in all this work was an abstract theory of a Carton pairs. Which abstract pairs of algebras in a commuted to subalgebra actually come about as a groupoid pair? So let's start with groups because groups are one object ample groupoids. I think for this audience, I don't need to explain what's a groupoid. And so if we can't say anything about groups, we're not gonna be able to say anything about groupoids. So let's start with groups. So let G be a group and R be an integral domain. Actually, in our paper, where we work beyond integral domains, but I'm making everything an integral domain here just to make life easier. So then there's an old problem going back to the 1940s, which is called the isomorphism problem for group rings. And the question is, suppose that RG is isomorphic to RH, where G and H are groups, as R algebras. Must G be isomorphic to H? Now, since you guys are C-star algebraists, you immediately say this is ridiculous, but this is the kind of thing we want to do for group points. So of course, the first thing you learn in Fourier analysis on finite groups is that any two finite abelian groups of the same order have isomorphic complex algebras, which are also their C-star algebras. So the answer is no. So you might just say, forget about groups. You cannot hope to recover the group from the group algebra. But the problem actually is that the complex numbers are too, too big. You have way too many roots of unity in the complex numbers. You might sooner hope that if the integral group rings are isomorphic, then the groups are isomorphic. Actually, if you think about it, you can get all the other group rings by extending scalars. So the integral group ring is the only one that has a chance of distinguishing them. If the integral group rings are isomorphic, then all the group rings are isomorphic. So that's your best bet. And so for a long time, starting in the 40s, people tried to show for finite groups that isomorphic group rings means isomorphic groups. And for finite abelian groups, that's true. So if you have two finite abelian groups with isomorphic integral group rings, then the groups are isomorphic. The Fourier analysis argument falls apart because you can't you know, average and stuff like that. And then they proved it for, you know, you, got, you take your favorite book on finite groups and they have hierarchies of finite groups and they went up the hierarchy until they found a problem. So Hertwig in 2001 gave two non-isomorphic groups of order two to the 21st times 97 to the 28th. Yes, that's not a typo. That's the real order of those guys with, with isomorphic integral group rings. Of course, people already suspected by the 50s or 60s that these kind of guys should exist and Brouwer kind of had a program for finding them, but Hertwig finally found them. And those are big groups, right? But they're solvable groups. There's no simple groups in there. That's a solvable group. So you cannot recover these groups from their group rings over any base. But that's because we're looking at finite stuff and nobody thinks finite stuff is interesting in non-commutative geometry, right? So how do we actually prove that group rings are isomorphic? So as far as I know, I mean, not that group rings, but, but the isomorphism of group rings gives isomorphisms of groups. So as far as I know, there's actually only one way that's known to work to do this kind of thing. And it involves the notion of trivial units. So if you have a unit of the, of the, of the ring R, the integral domain R, and you multiply it by a group element, you obviously get a unit. The inverse the U is U inverse G inverse. And these are called trivial units. And the group ring is said to have no non-trivial units if every unit's trivial. <coughs> and you can actually make the definition for twisted group rings, which we're gonna need since we're twisting stuff. So for twisted group rings with, uh, with only trivial units, you can determine the group and the twist basically from its group ring. So the R, the R algebra isomorphism class of the twisted group ring recovers the group and the twist. And that's the kind of stuff you want to do with a Carton pair. So let me just remind you what is a twisted group ring. My notation is RGC. You have a normalized two cocycle. 
And then we take as an R basis, since we're, we're doing anal analysis here, we call them delta Gs. Group theorists would just call them Gs. And we twist the product by using the co-cycle. And since the co-cycle takes on values that are unit, the, the delta Gs are units. And so are the multiples of them by units. And if we have the trivial co-cycle, we get back the group ring. In general, we have this subgroup of trivial units. So we're allowed to multiply a group L, uh, delta G by a unit, and this will be a unit. And we have a central extension. We have it's the scalars from R, those are central and invertible, the invertible ones. We have these trivial units. And if we quotient out by the, by, the, by the units coming from R, we get the group G. And this is a central extension, and it's exactly the central extension corresponding to this cohomology class. The cohomology class of two cocycles gives you a central extension and vice versa. So you can actually just see in the group ring the central extension. And I'll say the twisted group ring has no non-trivial units if these are the only units, the trivial ones. And now I'm going to show you how to recover the twist from the group ring, because what we do for the general case of group voids is basically the same idea, but with a lot more machinery and a lot more obscure stuff going on. So if you understand this, you get the basic idea. So suppose your group ring has no units and you have an isomorphism of another twisted group ring with your group ring. Then since units go to units under an isomorphism, you must map the trivial units for H into the units for, for, for G. But if we're assuming that G has no non-trivial units, you're actually going into the trivial units. So you get a commutative diagram of exact sequences, which is the identity here. And then since phi is an isomorphism of algebras, it's injective, but it also must be surjective because the delta H guys span the group ring and therefore their image must span this twisted group ring. But if you're missing any line, these RXGs are like lines through elements of G, you're not going to be able to get the entire twisted group ring. So it has to actually be on G. And therefore you've recovered the cohomology class because you covered, recovered both the group and the exact sequence. Okay, now basically the same thing we do for twisted groupoids algebras, but we replace all these groups by inverse semigroups. And then once you, if you like the, the, if you like the yoga of inverse semigroups, then you can basically play the same game. Okay, so then you have to ask, are there group rings with no non-trivial units? So if G has something called the unique product property up, then this has no non-trivial units. I'm not gonna define this property, but if your group has a stable left order, it's left orderable, then it has this funny property. So if your group is left orderable, like a torsion free abelian group, a free group, a braid group, Thompson's group F, there's lots of examples of these guys, then you only have trivial units in your twisted group rings. Um, all these UPP groups are torsion free. Um, Graham Higman proved that if an integral group ring has no non-trivial units, then when you take the direct product with the cyclic group of order two, C2 is a cyclic group of order two, then you still have no non-trivial units. So you can have no non-trivial units and still have torsion. You just don't want to have, but not, not over a field, but over, over non-fields, you can have this kind of stuff. So just remember, these guys don't have to be fields. Higman also proved, this was in his thesis in the 40s, that if G is a finite abelian group of exponent dividing four or six, where it's a generalized Hamiltonian uh, quaternion group, then it also has no non-trivial units. Maybe that's not important. So there's something called Kaplansky's unit conjecture, which is actually Higman's unit conjecture. He had this conjecture, or it was a question really in his thesis, but it's Kaplansky who made it popular along with his other two famous conjectures, the zero divisor conjecture and the idempotent conjecture, which are probably more familiar to people in non-commutative geometry. <coughs> so Kaplansky's unit conjecture says that if G is torsion free and R is integral domain, then RG has no non-trivial units. This conjecture implies that there are no zero divisors and it also implies that there are no idempotents. So this was the strongest of the Kaplansky conjectures. But just this year, probably you guys know this, Giles, uh, Gardam placed on the archive a counterexample to the unit conjecture. So this conjecture is false, which is bad news for this talk, I guess. Uh, so his example is a torsion-free group with a free abelian subgroup of finite index. It's finitely generated. It's, it's, so it's a very nice group. It's a crystallographic group. And so it means that the no non-trivial units phenomenon is more widespread than previously believed. Actually, I guess experts didn't really believe this Kaplansky conjecture because unlike all the other capacity conjectures, it had no re relation to other parts of math. It's, it was only related to group algebras. So it was the least believed of those conjectures. I don't know if the other ones are believed either, but 
but I think this, the other ones are related to Farrell Jones and Atia Conjecture and this kind of stuff. So they're kind of more believed and known for more groups. In any event, his example is over the two element field. Is over the two element field. That's why I said the element two element field is nice. Uh, so we don't know what happens over characteristic zero, but he suspects also that in that case it's bad. It's just harder to find the elements. In particular, computers like to use two element fields. So I don't think for this audience I have to go over what is a groupoid. So I'm going to just do this quickly because I think we started late anyway. Um, so a groupoid is a small category where every morphism is isomorphism. I view the identities and the objects as the same set. And these are the idempotents. And we have a partial multiplication. And because I'm view viewing identities as ob objects as identities, the domain is just given by gamma inverse gamma, and the range is given by gamma gamma inverse. Is this way of looking at group boys totally happy for people? This is kind of the analysis way. It took me a while to buy into this. I was kind of an algebraist, so to me, a group boy had to have a separate set of objects and arrows and all this stuff, and it was like a five tuple. So I got converted. And we can view the, ob the objects, the identities, the units. So, unit is probably a bad name because unit and a group bring me something different than units <laughs> and group points. Um, so we can view G0 as a subgroup point where every element is just an identity. And the group is a group point with a single identity. I'm sure if you give a group theory course and you define a group this way, you'll be like laughed out of the group theory course. I like to define groups as inverse semi-groups with a single idempotent, but that's kind of the same philosophy. So to build interesting algebras from groupoids, we need to add topology. I probably don't have to tell you guys that. And so a topological groupoid is just a groupoid where you have a topology so that all the maps defined are continuous. And in this talk, all groupoids are Hausdorff. One shouldn't really assume that. Uh, and probably that will be like the next paper eventually, but at the moment they're Hausdorff. And we give G0 the subspace topology and then the domain and range since they're expressed in terms of multiplication in inverse are automatically continuous. And G is a tall if the multiplication is a local homeomorphism. That's the same as the domain being a local homeomorphism or the range. For some reason, everybody talks about the domain, but the multiplication is also a local homeomorphism. And that's probably more important. But anyway, it's all equivalent, so. Who says what's more important among equivalent stuff? <laughs> okay. Um, this is the secret history of atal groupways that maybe not everybody knows. They were introduced by Grotendieck and SGA to study toposis. That's the real history of atal groupoids. Um, SGA is the universal thing that you should just like make random references to when you're not sure where to find anything, because probably anything you want can be found in SGA and was done by Grotendieck. So you're probably just safe by saying that, but it really is there. In a series of mostly in a series of exercises, <laughs> and a group point is a, is ample if it's a tau locally compact and totally disconnected. And for since we're doing Hausdorff a tau group points, G zero is always cloped for us. That's the big difference between Hausdorff and non Hausdorff. For non Hausdorff, it's not closed. That's equivalent to being Hausdorff. So of course a group is a tall if and only if it's discrete because it has to be locally homeomorphic to a one point space because there's only one object. And you can make any totally disconnected locally compact space into an ample group boy consisting of identities. For this audience, I'm kind of going to do this faster because you guys all know this. This is might really for my ring theorist. And if you have a group act, a discrete group acting on a locally compact, totally disconnected space, you can form the action groupoid, which is I write as a semi-direct product. Some people call this the growth and deconstruction because it's also an SGA. <laughs> but for categories acting instead of for groups. And um, as a space, it's just G cross X with the, with the product topology. And I like to draw the arrow GX is going from X to G times X. And then you multiply in this very obvious way. So basically you're drawing like K, the Cayley diagram or the Schreier graph of the action of G on X. And then you realize you can actually make it a groupoid. Okay, so groupoid algebras. Um, so we start with a Hausdorff ample groupoid, and we have and as and we have a ring R, which would be an integral domain in this talk, but it doesn't have to be. And there's an R module, so I like to use R G, because I don't want to have to have a different. So everyone else in the world uses A R of G and calls them Steinberg algebras. I use my notation and call them groupoid algebras. I'm not sure who won this battle. In any event. Um, I use R G because then you use the same notation as for a group algebra. I guess the objection is people think this might be the, R, the free module on the set G, 
When I wrote my original paper, to me, G was a five tuple. A group point was a five tuple. G zero, G one, domain, range, multiplication, and a unit map. So a free module on a five tuple doesn't make sense. But okay, I, I can see the conflict, but I still don't think anyone would get confused. So as an R module, you're just looking at the locally constant functions from G to R with compact support. And then you use the convolution product. And since you guys are kind of analysts for the most part, you know that this sum is only finite because we have compact support and the group boys is a tall, so the fibers are discrete. And, our, and the, the, the algebra of continuous functions on the unit space, since the unit space is clopin, the compactly supported functions on the unit space live inside here. And this product, because the only way you can multiply two units is when they're the same, and then you get that unit back. This turns into the pointwise multiplication. So the pointwise functions from G0 to R sit inside as a commutative subalgebra of this groupoid algebra. So when I first started learning about groupoid algebras, I picked up Patterson's book, and he wrote everything with integrals. So I closed the book like, and put it away. And then I learned that you can write it as sum because it's a counting measure for a tall group point from, from a paper of Excel. And then I was happy. OK, so examples of, of groupoid algebras include group algebras, of course. Levitt path algebras, you just take the path groupoid of the graph. Inverse semigroup algebras, you take Patterson's universal groupoid. Matrix rings, because you can take a uh, equivalence relation groupoid, a finite equivalence relation groupoid, and many other things. If you do this semi-direct product construction or action groupoid, then you get what analysts call the cross product and what group theorists call this G group ring. The group G acts on the functions from X to R because G acts on X. And you can form the skew group ring or the cross product, whatever you want to call it. And there are lots of other examples. Now, how about twisted groupoid algebras? So I was giving this talk for people in Colorado coming from ring theory. And so I did not want to define Kumjian style twist because that definition is too complicated to absorb if you don't already know it. And so I cheated. And so I'm gonna do the same here, but those of you who know, and I think most of you know, know what I should be doing, okay? So I apologize for lying, but. So we can twist the group weight algebra by a locally constant two co-cycle defined on composable pairs into units. So our co-cycles take val values not in the torus. This is where we're different from analysis. We just allow them to take values in the units, like when you do a twisted group ring. And so the co-cycle condition is the usual one, but we need all these guys to be composable. And the locally constant is to keep things continuous. And I, my co-cycles will be assumed normalized. It just means that CXX equals one for units. Some people put other conditions in, but they're implied by this one. So I'm minimizing conditions. So as an R module, the twisted groupoid algebra, which I'll call RGC, is exactly as before. But now I twist the convolution product by the cocycle. Just like for a group ring, and because my cocycle is locally constant, this convolution is locally constant. And the continuous functions on G0 is pointwise multiplication still lives here because my normalized condition says I don't twist when I multiply units. And of course, this generalizes as a twisted group algebra. But as you guys know, this is a special case of the true definition of a twisted groupoid algebra. The correct definition uses twists. But if your groupoid G is paracompact, for example, and ample and second countable, then it's equivalent. If you have a second countable ample groupoid, it's already in Renault, you can find a global section. And you can actually replace that by paracompact. We have an example of an ample groupoid which is not paracompact and which does not admit a section. And it's, it's a complicated argument based on some crazy compact house door space whose chief cohomology does not vanish. <laughs> so it's a messy thing that we constructed for this purpose. Okay, so now our goal, now I'm gonna get into the real part of the talk, um, is to know, first of all, can we recover G and the twist from the pair consisting of the algebra and the commuted as subalgebra on the unit space? So, so um, in particular, if we take a twisted group ring and, and the ring R, that's such a pair because the, there's only one object. So the group, so the subalgebra on the unit space is just functions from a one point set to R. So it's just R. So it's our old problem from before. <coughs> and in the group ring case, we saw having no non-trivial units was enough to be able to recover the group and the twist. So the question that came up in all this stuff is what is the correct analog of units in the group boys setting? So you need to replace no non-trivial units by no non-trivial blahs. 
where blah is the analog of a unit in this thing. And so the correct analog of units in this context are the normalized, the inverse semigroup of normalizers of B, which if you know Kumpian theory should not surprise you. And we would also like to know if you're just given abstractly a pair consisting of an R algebra A and a commuted to subalgebra B, when does it arise in this way? So these are the two questions. So let me give you the basic setup to which I will add more shortly. R is an integral domain. A is an R algebra and I don't assume it's unital. These group weight guys are not usually unital. B is going to be a commu commutative torsion-free R subalgebra, which is generated by idempotence. So the torsion free uh, is something we need because it would be true if you had a groupoid. And if you don't do an integral domain, you have to replace torsion free by a more technical condition. That's why I did integral domains. Generated by idempotence. Well, if you have a compact, totally disconnected space, the functions on that space, the locally constant functions are generated by characteristic functions. And those are idempotence. So we need that condition to do like a Gelfand duality. And also we need that A, that B contains a set of local units for A. This is the algebraic version of B containing approximate identity for A, as far as I understand. I can't tell you what an approximate identity is, but if you gave me a multiple choice question, I would get it right. So for any finite, so the local units condition means that for any finite subset of A, there's an item put to B, so that F is fixed on both the left and right by E. It's in this corner or whatever you call these EAE guys. So this is kind of the substitute. We can't take limits of a net, so we can't build a real approximate identity. But this condition kind of says that the, these items form a net and they're doing the job of an approximate identity. Okay, so for instance, if you take a twisted groupoid algebra and the algebra in the unit space, you, you meet these conditions. Uh, the torsion free, actually both of these are torsion free modules. So that's, that's no problem. The local units are just the characteristic functions of, of compact open subsets of the unit space. So I'll call guys like this that come from groupoids, groupoid pairs. So that's something to call them. So normalizers, you guys more or less know, but there's a slight technical thing that arises because we don't have star algebras. <laughs> so a normalizer of B is an element of A and N, so that there's an N prime, which functions like an inverse partial isometry. So it satisfies the von Neumann regularity type condition and which conjugates B on either side into B. So in C star algebra world, you would just use N star and you wouldn't instead of N prime, but we don't have a star. So we're stuck with N prime. And then you can check that under the setup I had before using that A contains a set of, that B contains a set of local idempotence, sorry, of local units for A, you can check the idempotence of the normalizers commute and it's von Neumann regular by definition and that makes it an inverse semigroup. If you start off with a twisted group ring, RGC, the normalizers are just the units together with zero. Zero obviously normalizes because it's its own von Neumann inverse and it trivially normalizes. And in a group ring, the only other normalizers you have are units because you have to normalize the ring R and only units can do that. So normalizers do generalize units. The groupoid ring is spanned by normalizers. Um, well, you guys probably know this, but so a local bisection or a bisection is an open subset of my groupoid, so that the domain and range are, are injective when I restrict to them. <coughs> and the, for an ample groupoid, the compact bisections from a topology, a basis for the topology. That's equivalent to being ample. And a, for a group, a bisection is either empty or it's a singleton because if you have a subset of a group, they all have the same domain. So the only way the domain can be injective is if you have zero or one elements. So there aren't very many bisections on a group. And it's a trivial observation that if you have a function in the, in the groupoid ring, which is supported on a bisection and it takes values in the units of R, then it's a normalizer. This is the analog of the trivial units. Just like it's obvious that a unit times a delta G is invertible, it's also, fairly obvious how to invert this guy. The inverse will be the inverse bisection and then you have to suitably invert the F guy using the R cross stuff. So it's not difficult to check this out. You know, and you have to use the co-cycle too. The co-cycle plays a role in writing the inverse as well. If it was not, if there's no co-cycle, it'd be easier to write the inverse down. But anyway, you can sort of believe me on this. 
And of course, the, 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 the characteristic fun uh, functions of compact bisections span the algebra. That's why normalizers span the algebra. So we say a twist satisfies the local bisection hypothesis in the support of any normalizer a bisection. So this was a terminology I invented in the case of just ordinary groupoid rings. The so-called Steinberg algebra is not the twisted case, but then we went further. So a twist on a group satisfies the local bisection hypothesis precisely when each unit is supported on a singleton because the units are the normalizers and the bisections are the singletons or zero. And so this local hy bisection hypothesis is just the trivial unit condition. So I guess you guys all know what the isotropy group at a unit is. It's just the set of all, all groupoid elements that start and end at X. And you can show that if the set of points uh, where, whose isotropy satisfies the, uh, has the unique path property or the Kaplansky conjecture. So if the set of, 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 of isotropy groups, the set of X whose isotropy groups have only trivial units in their, all their group rings is dense, then G automatically satisfies the local bisection hypothesis for any twist. Actually, you can do a little bit better. You can replace G by the interior of the isotropy. So you actually only need to check this on the interior of the isotropy, not on the whole isotropy. But that was too technical to write out for my talk in Colorado, so I didn't. For instance, if you take a path groupoid, a path groupoid, all the isotropy groups are either infinite cyclic or trivial. Infinite cyclic group is orderable, so it satisfies the unique product property, UPP, and the trivial group is trivially satisfies UPP. It's also orderable. And so you always get that all the, all the, all the, group, all the, all the isotropy groups have this property, so you get the local bisection hypothesis for free. Uh, the same is true for um, the same is true if you do higher rank graphs. In a higher rank graph, all the isotropy groups of the group boys are free abelian, and free abelian groups have Laurent polynomial rings, and those have only trivial units. They're they're orderable groups. So I'll say that a concrete quasi Carton pair is a is a group boyd pair where the local bisection hypothesis is true. These are the concrete quasi Carton pairs. Then we'll have an abstract one as well. To define the effect one, I got to throw in conditional expectations, which you probably expected. Okay, that was a bad joke. All right, so, but I forgot to do that one in Colorado, so I got it off this time. So if you take a twisted group ring, so I, I guess I could go to the general case here. This was for the Colorado people. If you have a twisted group ring, there's a natural kind of trace. Well, it's really only a trace for an untwisted group ring, but there's a natural linear map to R where you take the coefficient of the identity. In the case that it's untwisted, that's the von Neumann trace. So if, now we have A and B coming from a, in our setup. So that meant that there are algebras, B is generated by idempotence and all that other stuff. We can define a conditional expectation, which generalizes us to just be an R linear map from A to B, which fixes B point-wise, and it should be a BB by module homomorphism, meaning it commutes with left and right multiplications by elements of B. So this is kind of the algebraic part of the definition of a conditional expectation in the C star theory. The difference is in C star theory, there's a lot of analytic stuff that like positivity and blah, 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 that I can't talk about. And we'll say that the conditional expectation is faithful if P A prime A is not zero for some A prime. For instance, if we have a groupoid pair coming from a twist over a Hausdorff groupoid, then restriction to the unit space is a faithful conditional expectation. And that generalizes the twisted group ring example, where taking the coefficient of one is restricting to the algebra of the unit space. And Watanabe, I think, first formulated the algebraic condition version of conditional expectation when he was studying all these kinds of Jones stuff. So now I can tell you what is an abstract quasi Carton pair. So A and B should be a pair where, you know, satisfying the setup conditions. But now we have extra conditions. The normalizer of B should span A, just like in the C star setting, and you should have a faithful conditional expectation. Then we'll say it's a Carton pair of B is maximal commutative subalgebra. That's the classical notion. And we say it's quasi Carton if you can choose P with an extra weird property. And the extra weird property is that the conditional expectation when applied to a normalizer should again be, should be a diagonal normalizer and it should be given by multiplying by an item. So if you like inverse semigroups, it should be a diagonal normalizer, which is less than or equal to N in the partial ordering on inverse semigroups. So this extra condition is that normalizers 
restrict to diagonal normalizers. And it's really a restriction in the inverse semigroup theory sense. Now you can show that every Carton pair is quasi Carton. It requires an argument. And I guess Rui says that one proves this kind of thing in the C star setting as well. That's probably where my authors came up with the argument, um, or at least the original version of the argument. Um, and you can also show that quasi Carton pairs have a unique conditional expectation. So I, 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 I didn't really know anything about conditional expectations, but it's good to have analysts who know what they're doing as co authors. And my co-authors certainly know a lot. So I'm very grateful for them. I knew nothing about Carton pairs before this. So, okay, so a groupoid pair is quasi Carton. You can check if and only if the local bisection hypothesis is satisfied. So the quasi part, so, so, so the conditional expectation has to then be the one that we talked about and it's quasi Carton, that, that's exactly when it happens. And the groupoid pair is Carton if and only if the groupoid is, is effective, which means the interior of the isotropy is G0. And don't confuse this with any other thing which is equiv equivalent to effective for a second countable Hausdorff groupoids, but it's not in general. This is what it means to be effective. Okay, so here's an example for the ring theorists that I did. If you take N by N matrices over R and you take B to be the diagonal matrices, then the diagonal matrices are spanned by the matrix unit Ida Boten's EIIs. The matrices are spanned by the standard EIJs. And those are normalizers where the inverse is just EJI, that's the inverse partial isometry. The, the full normalizers are just the monomial matrices with elements in R cross. So they have at most one non zero entry in each row and column. And that element should belong to R cross. And those are bisections because of the at most one row and non zero and entry row or column means they're supported on bisections. This guy is a maximal commuted to subalgebra. You have a conditional expectation, which just takes the diagonal of a matrix. And so you get a Carton pair. And as a groupoid, of course, you just take n objects and one arrow between any two guys. So this was kind of a ring theorist. You guys, I think, all know this. <coughs> so here's our reconstruction theorem by A C cubed L M R S squared. I think it sounds better as a mathematical equation. <laughs> so let A comma B be a quasi Carton pair. The number one, there is a twist over an ample groupoid G and an R linear isomorphism of pair. So that means you have an isomorphism from A to this groupoid algebra, which sends B to this commuted as subalgebra. And two, the twist is unique up to the obvious notion of equivalence. So quasi Carton pairs all come from groupoids, and the groupoids are essentially unique. So, how to do the twist? So how do we actually do the twist? How do we get this twist? So I, this, this slide is kind of my interpretation of what we do in the paper. It's not the same way we write it in the paper, but this is how I think about it. If you get a quasi Carton pair, you get an exact sequence of Boolean inverse semigroups. So I didn't define an inverse semigroup, but there are semigroup which every element acts like a partial isometry <laughs> in a sense. It has a, a unique inverse in that sense I talked about before. And Boolean just means that the idempotents form a Boolean algebra and you have a certain amount of distributivity, which I don't want to get into. So if you look at the normalizers of B and A, that's a Boolean inverse semigroup. The Boolean structure comes from the idempotents of a ring being a Boolean algebra. Then you have a subalgebra, which are the diagonal, the diagonal normalizers. That's a subalgebra. And in the case of a quasi Carton pair, that will look like the inverse semigroups of bisections on a trivial group bundle. That's what it will look like. And then because the normalizer of B normalizes B, this is a normal inverse sub semigroup. There is a definition of normal inverse sub semigroup. And so you can form this quotient. And then there's a functorial equivalence between appropriate exact sequences of Boolean inverse semigroups and twists of ample groupoids. So you can go back and forth between exact sequences where this is the twist of a trivial bundle and, and twists of ample groupoids. And uh, there's a cohomology class that classifies everything. And so that's how we get the twist. And if A and B came from a group weight pair, you can show that these are exactly the, the guys you would have started with if you just started with the twist and went to the inverse semigroups. That's actually how I did it in my original paper when I had no twist. But basically, you find that if A and B came from a group weight pair with a local bisection hypothesis, you would get the compact open bisections of, of the twist viewed as a central extension 
you'd get the trivial group bundles, compact bisections, and you'd get the original group wedge yeast compact bisections here. And the, and the proof of this is the proof of this is exactly what I did in the group ring case, more or less, but it's more complicated. But it's basically the same idea as how you get the isomorphism of sequences. Then there are some other ingredients. There's a theorem of Kaimel that says that any torsion-free commutative R algebra generated by idempotence is comp is the compactly supported functions on a unique locally compact totally disconnected space. So if we start off with the quasi-ton quasi-carton pair, that's how we show that B is the algebra of functions on the unit space of our groupoid. And then we use the conditional expectation to somehow leverage that to get the isomorphism of the groupoid ring with A. So if you just care about recovering the groupoid, you don't need this stuff. But if you want to go and show that if you started with an abstract quasi-carton pair and it's isomorphic to the concrete one, then you have to do this stuff. <coughs> and that's all I have to say. So hopefully I made it in 50. Yeah. Very nice. So uh, yeah, let's time to speak up. So uh, any questions? Yeah, You'll put, put, up the main put up the main put theorem the again. So this is for our, uh, what was the condition on R? It was it had to be an inter integral domain. But you don't need it to be an integral domain. It should have just no items except for zero and one. Okay, that was what I was, that was, what I was going to ask. And there's that's, a, all, that's all you really need. I just then, the definition of torsion free, you have to modify appropriately. And, uh, and you also have, you have to do some extra work to show that the twisted groupoid rings of, of those nice UPP groups also have only no non-trivial units. You have to also prove that, which is, you know, people who do algebraic geometry know how to do it, but. Since I couldn't find it in the literature, I just had to prove it. <laughs> but yeah, that's the real condition. Okay. Of course, if R itself has idempotence, then you're going to have trouble because then even if you start off with a one point space, you, then the spectrum is no longer a one point space. So you don't want R to have any of its own idempotence. Or R already has a spectrum. You need R to have a trivial spectrum, a trivial maximal ideal spectrum or something, or, prime, or a Boolean, a trivial idempotent maximal ideal spectrum. <laughs> spectrum. So that's, uh, yeah, we, that's all you need. However, I should mention that there's basically no chance to have the local bisection hypothesis if R has nil potent elements unless the, the group weight is topologically principal. So if the group weight is not topologically principal, then as soon as you have nil potent elements in the ring, you'll be able to construct bad, bis bad bisections. But if it's topologically principal, then, 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 then it's okay. <laughs> and there is also an abstract, I didn't say it, but we have an abstract characterization of which A comma Bs come from a, a principal groupoid. So an equivalence relation. I guess we didn't separate topologically principal though. That, that was gonna be my next question. If, if you get something stronger, if you have a principal groupoid. Than yeah, just... so then you can assume that your normal, like in the in Kumjian's paper, you can assume that it's, that's equivalent to being spanned by normalizers whose square are zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's exactly the same condition <laughs> as in Kumjian's paper. It, probably it's exactly the same proof as well. <laughs> I defer to my analyst experts who can read Kumjian's paper. <laughs> I just look at the I just look at analytic papers and try to abstract some algebra from it, but I don't pretend to actually understand any of the analysis. So I should also comment that we do have algebraists here in our audience that do things like hop algebras. So they're probably on oh. your side with respect to the analysis jokes. But, uh. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that that we had people who were non C star people. I thought I was the only non C star person. Oh, okay. I really should have taken that class with Rifo. That was a big mistake. <laughs> I could go back in time. I would, I would take that class, <laughs> and I would have dropped my algebraic geometry class. But <laughs> oh well. well. Actually, we did, we did use algebraic geometry in this paper for one lemma. So I guess I needed it, but <laughs> it was pretty baby algebraic geometry, so not serious. <laughs> yeah. The way. Yeah. Actually, maybe just continuing. Karen's point, like so the so you're saying R as long as it doesn't have any what idempotence, then you're you're in business, right? So yeah, otherwise 
you know, you probably, you might not really want to work with exactly our linear maps. You might have to figure mm -hmm. out what it is you really want to work with. Because the problem is already the case of a space. If you start off with the space, then if you want to really recover it as an R module, you really, instead of locally costed functions, you have to go to sheaves. So right. for any, for the base space, you can, you can get as the global sections of the Pierce sheaf on the space. Mm -hmm. And so you can work with sheaves. Like I, you've written stuff involving sort of sections of bundles. Me and Daniel Gonsalves have stuff about doing uh, group weight algebras with coefficients in the sheaf. So if you're willing to do group weight algebras with coefficients in the sheaf, you can probably, or something like that, you can get rid of that condition probably. Yeah. I'm but just, uh, then I, again, I, then I don't know what will replace the local bisection hypothesis. You probably want that the bisection takes values in the in the subsheaf of un, the unit subsheaf. So you, the right. units form a close or form a nice subsheet, either open or close an open one, maybe even a clopin one or something like that. The units I think are clopin. So so you, you can probably try to play that game. I didn't try to play that game yet. This is complicated enough. But yeah, so the problem is if you want to do this with rings which have mm -hmm. their own idempotence, you have to work with sheaves instead of locally constant functions. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, in the stuff I did, I, I think I sort of got around these issues by just just remembering the the sub algebra which takes values which are actual units, right, in the ring. So you'd have this, you'd have extra data, right? You you can't just get away with a pair. You need this extra sub algebra, and if you want to do, if you want to avoid the local bisection hypothesis, then you you just add in this this semi group, which is like your local bisections, basically. So again, yeah, I guess it's a different kind of philosophy, but yeah. Yeah, so the question is, do you want to generalize the objects you're using or do you want to figure out which ones come from these objects? Now, I think yeah. if you're willing to do, I mean, the twisted, the group rings, with, the group void rings with coefficients in, in, a, in a sheaf kind of are like, again, fell bundle things. In fact, I think you can almost translate between fell bundles over group voids. I convinced myself at one point and sheaves, uh, at least of commutative rings. I didn't think about the non-commutative case. I was only thinking about sheaves of commutative rings, but um, so at least in the commutative case, I think fell bundles over tau group voids with the natural hypothesis are the same thing as these, these coefficient, group void convolution algebras with coefficients in the sheaf. Um, and then, and these are again the same thing as inverse semi-group cross pro products or skew rings. If you throw a twist in, then it would be like a cross product, an inverse semi-group cross product. So yeah, there are a couple of languages. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, you're talking about sheaves, but also Hui has this thing where he looks over like fell bundles over inverse semigroups, and to me that looks yeah. Kind of and like these, these I sheaves. think, can be turned into sheaves over yeah, yeah. over the universal group void. So yeah. you can work with inverse semigroups, or you can work with group voids, and there's not a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and for some problems, some one perspective is easier, and from other problems, other things are are easier. So I don't know, sometimes I want to prove something about inverse semigroup algebras and I find the group ways make life a lot easier. But for the simplicity results, I found the other way. That's easier to characterize simple group void algebras using inverse semigroups rings. So, so it goes both ways. I'm not, you know, depending on the problem, sometimes one view is easier than the other. But they're basically, yeah. you know, a, almost a dictionary between. I don't, I don't think there's a big difference between, you know, sheaves or fell bundles over invert groupoids and versus uh, versus over inverse semigroups and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the classical twist stuff. What I like about the classical twist is it's easy to understand, and it's easy to find examples where you get this local bisection hypothesis. Because the only way I really know how to check this local bisection hypothesis is to check that enough isotropy groups have the unique path property. The UP, I mean, not unique path, unique product property, UPP. I don't know any other real way to check it, you know, for someone hands you a groupoid. So I imagine when you add these more general structures, it's even harder to check that you actually, you know, in an example, whether you have it or not. Yeah, the, yeah, the local, yeah, maybe. Yeah, how do you actually it? check it? <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess you don't need to if you just remember the semigroup, right? Like it's sort of it's not an issue. You can, yeah, I mean, you can you can ask yourself the question: Can you recover the semigroup in some way? And you can have different notions of normalizers and things like this. But yeah, yeah, I noticed. Actually, yeah, or or so, you have to ca carry the whole inverse semigroup around. Then these inverse semigroups can also be quite complicated. <laughs> I mean, these the sequ exact sequences of inverse semigroups or normal inverse sub semigroups. That's a messy theory in its own right. I mean, I see that's sort of the approach I think using your paper to use this theory of kind of normal inverse sub semi groups and all that stuff. And then you have to, and everything works even if you throw in Boolean and that's fine. Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't think our approaches are orthogonal, are orthogonal or anything. It's just kind of 
I think you've gone more general than we have, but and we kind of went more kind of trying to figure out which, which pairs of algebras exactly come from the classical constructions. And we haven't tried to do like who we suggested in my talk, we should look at non-commutative ones and show that you get, you know, kinds of fell bundles, which may be what your paper that you just put on archive is yeah, doing. Yeah, this is what I, what I called Steinberg bundles, actually. So sort of the yeah, zero dimensional versions of fell bundles, but yeah. That was in the previous, uh, but did you, did you the them for abstract algebra pairs as, or for abstract rings as well? Or did you just say, here's a way to construct and it has many examples? I can't remember now. I know I yeah, there was a paper, but yeah, that yeah. it's really I mean, long. It was a characterization, but it's, it's using more data, right? So you just have a pair, whereas, whereas I had to have yeah. this extra semi-group as well as this extra sub-algebra. So yeah, so it was extra, But we have a pair and, and the conditional that. expectation. That's also yeah, a little yeah. bit of a, of, a, of a cheat. But for the quasi-carton one, it's unique. So in some sense, you don't really need it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but of course, if we had the inverse semi group, we wouldn't need the conditional expectation. Mm -hmm. And the conditional expectation is really defined on the inverse semi group and extends. Yeah, because it's because you everything's generated by the inverse semi group, right? So then, yeah, it's all and, and the quasi Cartan condition says that the image of it on the inverse semi group is in the inverse semi group, so you can just everything just lives there. There's no need for really the full conditional expectation. So, yeah, so I mean, certainly there's room for generalization, and I think you've done a lot. I don't know, you know, what is the right balance between not assuming too much data and, yeah, and, yeah. and getting a nice theory. So, that I don't remember what data who he assumes in his non commutative carton pair stuff either. I don't know what his data was. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I've looked at that paper, but yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. But... Yeah, I mean, okay, I shouldn't occupy all the time. Does anyone else have uh, any other questions? No, no other questions? Actually, maybe I can just ask one final question. Sorry to keep everyone, but uh, so you, you have this more recent paper, I think, where you look at sort of morphisms between uh, these things, right? Whereas here, you're, here, I guess you're just looking at, you know, isomorphisms in some sense, right? Yeah, so the, the more general paper was looking not so much at algebras as twists. So morphisms between twists correspond, to, so twists correspond to exact sequences of inverse semigroups and morphisms between these exact sequences correspond to morphisms of twist and these all correspond to cohomology classes in the Lausch cohomology theory of the, of the inverse semigroup. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of go over to algebras by realizing the, the groupoid, the twisted groupoid algebra is a, as a cross inverse semigroup cross product. And I think you could probably give the algebra isomorphism in this paper using the cross product construction as well. And it would probably be a little bit shorter than what we do in the paper, but I didn't try to do that. But the, the, the idea was that the normal way you go from a groupoid to an inverse semigroup is not functorial with respect to arbitrary inverse semigroup homomorphisms. And so there are different things you can do. Now, there are different solutions. One thing is to use some sort of, you know, Scandalese, uh, Hilsum type maps. Another option is to put weird inverse semigroup homomorphisms, which preserve, uh, which give you covariant maps. I think Mark Lawson does other weird homomorphisms, which makes it dual. Uh, so you can do weird stuff. But in the twist context, when you're doing exact sequences of group woods, you want your morphisms to be identities on the object space. And when people do exact, uh, exact sequences of inverse semigroups, they always wanted the morphism to be the identity on eigenpotents. And then everything that Axel and, all the, and Lawson and all these guys do are totally functorial for that kind of map with no extra work. It's just, as long as, as long as the objects and eigenpotents are preserved, then it's totally functorial. And then you, the twists go exactly to exact sequences of inverse semigroups and back. And then Laus showed in the 70s that you can classify these exact sequences by cohomology classes. In his cohomology theory, I think, and that's where you can classify twists. Yeah, yeah. With Lawson stuff, I think he was maybe more interested in maps which don't necessarily preserve units because he was interested in generalizing like stone duality and. And he also duality. wanted them going backwards. I have a exactly, paper right, the opposite David, direction. Yeah. Me and David Milan had a paper a number of years ago where we found some, a type of homomorphism which gave forward direction maps, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, we call them, I think, coherent or something, because if you put a different topology on the, on the groupoid, not the standard patch topology, but the stone topology thing, then it corresponds to coherent maps in the sense of stone duality type theory. And those ones we were able to get a forward direction <laughs> or something like that. I don't remember the details anymore. And those mm -hmm. maps actually are things that came up in inverse semigroup theory. And we use that to give a inverse semigroup theory, a theory proof of a 
result of Kashkaim and Skandalisa, showing that certain inverse semi group algebras were cross products. Right. Up to Merida equivalents. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Yep. Thanks for answering all those questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess if no one else has any anything more, maybe we can wrap it up. So let's maybe just one more time. Thanks the speaker again. Thank you. And I'll pass it over to Karen thanks. to talk about next week's talk. So next week's talk will be Laurent Cantier from Barcelona, and he will talk about topologically based Kuhn's semigroups. And I apologize that I, I meant to announce this in, in Monday's email, but uh, for, because the uh, abstract was book length, I, I guess I forgot by the time I got to the end. So yeah, I hope you'll visit back to the regular time, four o'clock uh, Central European summer time. No, it's just, yeah. All right, so hope, hope to see some of you there.